let's get this started. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody for the first uh, lecture that is uh, funded by the Rouse Visiting Artist Fund. We'll have more events uh, later on this semester, next semester. So this is uh, the very first uh, lecture. Let me start by just framing a little bit uh, uh, the invitation to Raiku, who has uh, come from Japan. And we're very, very grateful to have Professor Sudo come here. Uh, it's a long way, after all, and she's very busy. Uh, but um, since I've been here a while, I just uh, I want to bring a, cup up a couple of things that relate maybe with the, the issue of textile design to what most of the folks do in this building. Um, on, on the one hand, since I'm actually in the fabrication and materials area, it is interesting for me to have you here today because in the courses that we teach on computer-aided uh, computer manufacturing and digital fabrication, the historical starting point is actually textile production and the kind of beginning automation and digitization of controls with the Jakar loom. So I think having you here in a way, actually I th I'm sure we're going to be able to make some interesting connections to sort of the beginnings of digital control and fabrication, which of course now has become very much uh, sort of widely used. Uh, second, uh, just um, when I was thinking of your work and uh, I was thinking also of Toshiko Mori, who's a professor here uh, from Japan and uh, a while ago, in a way, her teaching began to trigger an interest in weaving uh, in the school. And it was actually really a couple of years where there's a lot of interest in weaving, not so much uh, as the actual process of producing fabrics, but more as a metaphor to introduce an interest in materiality through a study of material processes, uh, which I thought was actually quite, quite important. So I think in general now, it, 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 uh, today, materials and material processes have become quite instrumental uh, in the way they can inform design and design thinking. And I think today we're going to see a very interesting um, uh, kind of work that is, is obviously uh, on the production of these these fabrics and the products, but relating also to the, the artifacts that will be made uh, from those uh, products. So I think uh, it relates very much to uh, what we do here at the design school. So let me now really introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Raiko Sudo. Um, we're very, very happy to have you here. Uh, I should say Professor Sudo, because uh, you are, of course, a professor of textile design uh, at the Tokyo Zoka University. Uh, let me just uh, very briefly say a couple words about the background. So uh, you completed textile design studies uh, at uh, Musashino Art College, which you then continued to work at uh, as a researcher on issues of textile design. Uh, you then founded uh, Nuno, which is very much you, but I learned there's actually a much larger group of designers, but this is really your, your uh, company, uh, your sort of invention. And I think it, it's fair to say that, that Nuno and your work is, is really occupying a very, very important, pl in important place in contemporary textile design. Mm -hmm. Uh, much beyond Japan, uh, and cl a clear indication are the kind of exhibitions you've uh, had and you are having of your work in really major museums. Uh, the Boston MFA uh, is included, uh, the Met in New York, the Victoria Albert Museum in London, the Tokyo National Museum of Modern Art Craft Gallery, uh, as well as other museums. So very widely exhibited work, very influential work. Um, for me, it was also interesting that you become a consultant for other companies that are not just dealing with, uh, with fabric-based products, but with other products. Uh, Muji is one of those companies, which is a, a Japanese retailer. Uh, I think it's about affordable good design, a very, very interesting combination that we sort of still don't quite have in the US, I think. Uh, so I think it, it's important to sort of see how the sort of excellence in fabric and textile design ha has led you to other engagements in, in a much broader level uh, throughout the sort of broader uh, design industry. So with that, I think we'll turn it over to you. Uh, we'll have time for questions and discussion to the end. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Please thank welcome you. Raiko Sudo. Thank you very much. Hello, san would you like to say something? No? <laughs> oh, yes. Hello, I'm Reiko Sudo of Nuno Corporation. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express how honored I am to be invited here today. So I prepare about 
100, more than 100 uh, images, so you can see um, how we, Nuno, developed since 1984. Uh, thanks, Mo Sen-san, um, whom I met in probably 2008 or seven uh, at a shop in Tokyo, uh, together with the Japanese architect, Toyo Ito. Perhaps it the uh, common thread of uh, interests, or perhaps because um, textiles are so close to people's life everywhere. Uh, whenever I meet someone from the world of textile, uh, it's like um, connecting with an old friend. Today, I'd like to talk about my company, Nuno. Uh, which I've been running for 33 years, and tell you about how our approach to textile has changed with the time since 1984. We worked with Japan to create some 2,500 textiles, many of which are now in some 35 museums worldwide. Now at uh, as it looks in 1984, full of indigo and unbreached fabrics. In the early uh, days of personal photocopies, we rendered African ikat pattern into a computer jacquard weave. This textile is in many museums around the world. This is my own a first museum collection textile picked by the Smithsonian, now then film camera, have all but disappeared. So design is fossil. Combination yarns with two different Shrek ratios uh, made this weave buckled up, creating a um, textile cedar pattern it was chosen for the collection of the Bouillon in London. In 1989, we experimented with the two beam, warp beam loom to uh, alternate low and high um, tension. Warps to create this fold here and there. My aim for Nuno has been to many high-tech with traditional Japanese weaving and dyeing. This textile woven with uh, stainless steel micro uh, wire and was selected by the St. Louis Art Museum. Using a German uh, automobile industrial technique called spattling, we vacuum uh, steamed particles of nickel, chrome, and steel uh, onto polyester to create stainless steel. This textile is in MoMA and Bouyanne and other museums. The miracle year, 1989, shocked the world. The Berlin Wall, uh, Tenemon, in keeping with these uh, changes. We uh, bounded news clippings from around the world onto cloth to make this Ajitfab, now in MoMA and St. Louis Art Museum. Here we first tried the stamping paper onto cloth, but it just dissolved. So we um, used rayon, which is also made from wood pulp and it works fine. Uh, cracked cloth is in a also MoMA collection. Calendaring is the process for finishing textile to high gloss under high pressure and heat. This is in the Museum of Fine Art, Boston. 10 years have passed since we made this fabric Toyo Ito selected it for his project. 
I learned through this uh, theater project, when fabric is ca calendared, it becomes very doable. We uposted um, the sheet with a shade of this fabric, and the entire hall took on a beautiful gradation. I brought some actual samples. You can just see um, the, the touch and so on. In 1993, I designed the fabric with feathers floating in sea organji, uh, silk organji pocket, my very first production in a kimono weaving town. After five years of visiting mills all over Japan with handmade mock-up, getting nothing but rejections. I finally had to camp out at one mill and insert feathers myself while they stopped and restarted the loom. The feathers were from fowl for restaurant. The combined hand and machine processes become an instant Nuno trademark, now in over 20 collections worldwide. Oxide, rust, can stain fabrics. This led us to invent a very primitive method for printing different free form patterns. Very simple, by bearing the placement of the metal scraps and length of weather, weathering time. Nails and bar bar barbed wire we did works very well. The 1990s were out um, our hybrid textile era. We made textile with metal, paper, packing tapes all sorts of crazy materials. We often use the paper in our textiles like this strip stream, handmade from kozo, mulberry fibers, strong mino washi was traditionally used for making shifu paper cloth. We slip uh, thin uh, strips between layers of silk organdy, creating patterns like floating water in the Philadelphia Museum of Art and four other places. This fabric started as a feria. We tried to uh, weave a polyester tafta, but it kept turning. So, we cut it up into four millimeter and eight millimeter thread yarns, which we sewn down onto a water-soluble backing fabric made from the same stuff as laundry starch. We then washed away the backing ribbons to leave a lace-like pattern. It's a German technique from 1864, though originally they used silk washed away with lye. This fabric is folded repeatedly at sharp, crisp angles, as for origami, the Japanese art of folding paper, and dyed in three separate um, shoots. Then permanent pressed using a patented printing processes. Selected for the uh, collection of uh, the MoMA and 10 other museums. A 
around this time, we um, boiled and burned and tortured textile to create many uh, unique aesthetics. Expen experiments with no um, obvious application. Many of our textile in the 1990s used Japanese washi paper, handmade paper. Here we uh, silk screened glue onto linen, then pressed down sheets of washi by hand, then washed away fibers from unglued areas, leaving a pattern in paper. In 1998, MoMA launched a major exhibition of Japanese contemporary textile exhibition, which included 25 of Nuno uh, works. The show then traveled all over and really put Nuno on the map. We made many different textile with metal, wire, copper, brass, stainless steel. This stainless steel microfiber for radial tires uh, developed by the uh, Bridgestone. A supple like cotton, but heavy as steel, which is hard on looms. We've done a three repeat production so far. Each had different meals. No one ever want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> After weaving, we finished the surface with the burner to get rainbow effect. In 2001, with support from the Kyoto city government, I had my first solo show in Kyoto. A mecca for weavers and dyers um, throughout Japan. I met with strong criticism that we had bastardized Japanese textile design. Not nice to hear, very depressing, in fact. But many curators and uh, researchers from abroad were favorably impressed and invented us to exhibit in their uh, countries uh, leading up to this talk today. I also got work from major architects like Jun Aoki, which gave me steady income and the strengths uh, designing interior textile made me appreciate the aesthetics and the practicalities of large scale, large spaces. When textiles are used as architectural materials, rather than for human um, sizes applications, <laughs> like clothing, the visual impact is entirely different. Uh, quality and reputation, no, reputation, repetition, uh, transform them into something totally new, which changes the design processes. Here we used tape, uh, tape twist for some 3,000 air conditioning baffles in the Showa Kinen Park Museum by architect Toyo Ito. 
no two buffles are the same, so it took two months to make and install by ourselves. Stitching together in a lace-like way with a special steering wheel embroidery machine used for wedding kimono. This design plays on rolled up papers built across wise. Paper roll is mounted on the ceiling of the resort hotel lobby near Tokyo Disneyland. As the 1990s ended, a raw era, new era in textile began. We become more aware of our limited natural resources and our overused uh, uh, petroleum. Unlike plant and animal materials like cotton and wool, petroleum-based material cannot be grown. Around this time, a new technology was invented for completely recycling uh, petroleum polyester and nylon. So we changed to this new system to help relieve Japan's develop, uh, dependence of fossil fuels. Based on a patented origami breeze technique from the 1990s, 10 years later, we added a heat cut bent to achieve a net design. From this new Tanabata fabric, um, we created a huge tapestry like this, and 40 lanterns for the in Intercontinental Hotel in Tokyo. Here is a textile we made for the facade of the Louis Vuitton Ginza boutique. We held in depth uh, meeting with the architects and always made full-scale models. We also conducted tri trials with the lighting expert to see how it looks in light and shade. Once we drafted our template, all the folding was done by hand. It took three people a whole day to fold a set of one meter square uh, templates. This number of templates took a whole month of con constant folding, all done by Nuno staff members. Polyester remembered the shape when heated. We applied this to create origami, pleats, and tanabata using poly, uh, paper template to uh, mold fold. We also create um, uh, wavy shapes and uh, layered to reflect light. Here is a seven meter light uh, cartons for the restaurant Jan George in Tokyo. In 2005, Nuno celebrated its 21st anniversary. I received an invitation from UCF Farnham, UK, to do a show. Supported by the Art Council, this installation of textile column, 1.5 um, diameter and six meter in height. Also traveled to Austria, Germany, and Japan. 
including Ibaraki, where I was born. The transparency of monofilament um, thread and cut fringe give this fabric uh, bounce. The fringes are first rough cut by hand, then uh, evened off with a cropping machine. In 2006, we undertook a large hotel project designing all the interior textile and decorative items. For the Mandarin Oriental Tokyo, it's a foreign-owned hotel chain. But the project um, director, respectfully, agreed to uh, commission Japanese artisans or which I'm grateful to this day. Fifteen years have passed since we made our first presentation. For and ten years since the hotel opened in 2006. Yet none of our interior textile looks dated in the last. We are proud our design contributed to Mandarin Oriental Tokyo six star reputation. In 2007, this cut infused a cut jagger technique to mimic the arches of architects Toyo Ito's Tama Art University library. I brought actual samples. Please touch it. This cut infused a uh, cut jagger technique. <laughs> and another fuse a uh, cut jagger uh, technique to design the three um, branches of architect Jun Aoki. Wow, it's something missing, but the actual piece is there. Oh, this one. This glow in the dark fabric uses fibers that store daylight and release uh, energy at night. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In 2009, we made fabric uses optical fiber. Lots of try and error. This bench was designed by French architects Guena Nicola At his uh, request, I made a textile covering out of hand knit, hand crochet knit uh, rayon optical fibers that sense movement. Switching on and off as people come and go. In 2008, we did a textile installation at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. for a Japanese culture event. Other participants included Tadao Ando and Yayoi Kusama. We did a coin overy frying cup in 69 different Nuno textile. Lots of fun. Two years ago,
six years after the Kennedy Center, we exhibit our koinobori again at the Guimet Museum in Paris. Adding another 20 carps for a total of 89, they swam there for three months. Since 2008, we are committed to reducing waste from spinning and milling uh, processes. One big project focuses on making use of kibiso. Uh, this uh, protects protective uh, outer surface of silk cocoon. This here. Typically discarded as too uh, tough to loom. When I learned about kibiso, I immediately uh, felt inspired, uh, inspired to do something with this waste product. I appreciated two uh, companies to experiment with it. Unfortunately, the fiber were too um, dense. They wouldn't spool on the shuttles and they damage uh, slicer uh, brand. Both companies give up. Working with elderly women in Tsuroka, uh, in Yamagata, one of Japan's last silk weaving towns, I started a kibiso hand weaving project. In 2010, the fashion brand Hunting World began selling the kibiso bags they made. These women set up looms in their garage and the kitchens for extra family income and made good use for kibiso yarn. The women also hand knit hats out of kibiso, which even protects against UV uh, radiation. These Japanese walaji sandals are like the straw ones worn by Buddhist monks. These are made in Tsuroka out of kibiso. The amino acid in the kibiso actually help soften the sole of the foot. They become popular items, but can only be handmade in very limited amount by artisans who make sandals for Kabuki actors. Today we've been able to um, refine kibiso down to thickness for uh, automatic machine looming. This textile have um, a suzushi, which is normal silk warp, and the kibiso weft. We've made a a uh, whole line of different kibiso fabrics, including this frame with Ogandi. A kibiso collection is now exhibited at the Cooper Hewitt a Smithsonian Design Museum from 23rd of this month through next April. Please bid it if you have a chance. The exhibition itself was designed by Toshiko Mori, who designed a MoMA show in 1998. Polyester remember shapes when he did. We took advantage uh, of this to create origami pleats and the tanabata using paper template. But now a new process allows us to weave fold right on the loom without a template. The woven fabric polygamy automatically shrinks into fold when put in hot water. Here are some polygamy rights created in 2015 
for the Oita Prefecture, Prefectural Art Museum designed by architect Shinyeru Ban. Finally, our company is now 33 years old, weaving areas are rapidly disappearing in Japan. So we actively try to keep them alive, drawing on local artisan talents and traditional skills to create new living textiles. We've changed its direction many times, but one important guiding value is our awareness of our finite planet. We try to focus on recycling and using things as far as they can do. Nuno is small and we can only do so much, but I want to con continue working as long as we can to create textile in Japan with local artisans and technician. I see my design work as a way of linking people to people and Japan to the world. Thank you for listening today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Thank you. Um, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, really has, uh, I think the work really has uh, redefined what it means to be a textile designer, because clearly this is, uh, this is much more uh, than designing these wonderful textiles. It's really a kind of three-dimensional art form, uh, and, uh, and it's been wonderful to see the range of, of projects that you brought uh, to us today. Let me correct one omission I made in my initial introduction, which was uh, uh, in order to respect her work, she has asked to not actually have these slide photographs. So if you have taken photographs, you need to actually now go into your phone and delete those. Thank you so much. Um, let me maybe start a, a conversation which we then uh, open up to everybody. Um, I mean, traditionally, uh, textile is, is really going from a 1D to a, three, a, a kind of 2D element, really. You've clearly expanded uh, to very, very much embracing the three dimensionality, not just of the fabrics, but of course of the applications that uh, they're used uh, for. Um, and uh, it seems to me that there may be, maybe and you can correct this, maybe there are two different mindsets at work here. One is a sort of uh, mobile product uh, mindset where the end goal really is this, and you don't claim or even know of the applications that some of these fabrics may have. And then there's another mindset where there is a project, and you've worked clearly with uh, some of the, the best uh, Japanese architects, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a site, the work has a location and you're creating a specific work uh, for that location. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the, the differences that may w make in your work um, in terms of the process, uh, how you approach the design to fabrication process. Well, of course, w when I design textile, it's really, really easy. It's like, uh, it's not easy. Always have some idea, and I just wanted to grab the uh, actual final like a result so that that was a very very uh, fun to do it but when I got some uh, uh, client like architect and so on I have to get their demand so that is the most difficult part for me maybe I'm so selfish <laughs> <laughs> Uh, like each architect has a, like a, their own strong image about uh, how how they want to like realize that like surface of the curtain. Uh, and uh, which which she thinks. It, uh, which she thinks really important uh, to respect their imagination uh, because because it inspires her uh, so much uh, to get beyond uh, like a, how, what she has imagined at first. 
あの、for example、this、えっ、ー、と、ステンレスティオっていうか、例えば、こういう、こういう金属の生地があるとすると、こう立つんですよね、こうやって。This, this can be st-、uh, like a standalone, like a, yeah, by fabric itself. で、テキスタイルって基本的には重力に無防備で、テキスタルは、これは、really like、vulnerable to the gravity、uh,、like、basically follows the gravity、yeah.。やっぱりあの構造物がないと絶対その形になり得ない。うん、そう、そう、like、we we usually think that、uh, like it, it cannot stand itself、uh, without any support。で、これはやっぱりあの伊藤さんと最初に会った時に伊藤さんがあのテキスタイルはこうはならないんですよ。こういうふうにはね。全部こういうふうになるでしょそれを伊藤さんこういうふうにしようよって言うわけです。<笑>できないそんなのっていう。<笑> so, so yeah, yeah, this, this kind of like demand、uh, was from Toyo Ito and、uh, like he, he explained that、uh, fabric is always this shape, like a catenary,、uh, like following gravity. But、uh, she,、uh, he, he suddenly said like、uh, he, want, he wants to make the fabric like this. And that, that's how it, it was born. <laughs> But he, he didn't use. <laughs> she tried so hard,、uh, like trying it, so like、uh, many different materials, like、uh, yeah, metals and. But、uh, yeah, she's very grateful that, that conversation with Toyoito that,、uh, that, that made such kind of innovative materials. This actually、um, brings up the idea that so the collaboration with, on the one hand, architects, but you also mentioned the artisans, the, 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 the weavers, the dyers, the, the craftspeople who you work with. So you just mentioned that the collaboration with the architects at, at certain times has brought about certain challenges. Which have sort of maybe advanced in, in some way or changed the work you do. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the, you mentioned at the end of the lecture that、uh, there's a risk of、uh, the sort of craft, the ability to make things, to, to handle fabric and weaving and dyeing, and these very advanced methods, that you see a risk of that、uh, disappearing in Japan. But maybe you, can, maybe you can lift the cover a little bit about the processes. I don't know if this is.、Uh, Pushing things too much, but tell us a little bit about、uh, do you work with these craftspeople? What is the relationship that you have with them? Have you found that what they do, they bring something to your work because of the limitations, the opportunities that they see from their manual work with the material? So maybe you can talk a little bit more about your collaboration. On the one hand, you talked about the architects. On the other hand, with the producers of, of your fabrics,、uh, to the degree that they're not produced in house. This is silk.
で例えばそういう技法を聞いたら<笑>なるほど塩みじんつけると汁が縮むんだと思うじゃないですか、はいはい、それで生まれたのがこれなんですなるほどでここの部分だけ汁が<笑> It's, it's really wrong to translate. <laughs> but, 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 yeah, but, 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 this, yeah, yeah. but this spot is, uh, this spot, uh, is uh, actually like, inspired from very traditional uh, skill of the um, like, craftsman in the very specific area in Kyoto, uh, uh, northern Kyoto. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's not in the, like, any document. Like, they already uh, transcend uh, that skill. Uh, and, uh, but maybe it's uh, originally found, it, it was originally found from the, like a very coincidence. Uh, and, uh, but uh, they, they have tried to con conceal the, uh, conceal the, how say, et etching or <laughs> like a scratch, scratch or, or yeah. damage of the silk. Uh, silk. And uh, they found that uh, like uh, they coincidentally um, Uh, probably they co coincidentally uh, for the for the this fabric into the sea seawater, and uh, that that seawater made uh, made the fabric shrink, and uh, and uh, and uh, inspired from that scale, like she she, uh, she proposed that kind of like a texture. So so maybe it's kind of like in, it, maybe yeah maybe maybe. Tabe so no So, so the uh, artisan uh, get all the information from like uh, people to f mouse to mouse, and I just uh, visited the beginning of 80s, and they are talking about the uh, uh, technique called enshuk, which is actually like uh, um, salt shrinking. So, what is the salt shrinking? And I just ask, and well, in old age, um, we produce textile and some damage happened and somebody got some uh, like accident to get the fabric shrink uh, when the fabric dropped into the seawater. So and they decided to get this technique as a uh, seawater shrinking. So and I have heard that story and I got mm, Maybe I could use that technique. And I visited Textile Institute in uh, uh, Kiryu, uh, which we have a studio in Guma Prefecture. It's about one and a half uh, to the north by train. And um, I explained to them, like, uh, there is a, a wonderful technique called Inshiku with a salt sinking. And maybe we could do something. Uh, like a new way. And there are so many um, chemicals like uh, shosan, calcium, I don't know how to, how, how to call, but it's the same as uh, salt. And we pasted um, silk cloth with the glue and dip into the like same as the salt water, then get the dark part in the, um, the area the salt, salt uh, get into, and to get the contrast, the contract, contrast, contract, contract shrink. Mm. It's, uh, shrink. So this is uh, becoming a standard technique of a silk uh, printing technique since then. So that sort of things are happening. And of course, so many um, artisans in the Uh, also industrial, um, different industrial people gave us a lot of uh, uh, influence. And in our country, uh, it's really easy to get into the other industrial um, property. So maybe your country or um, is t too huge, but in our country, still have a very, very, like this, Uh, spattling technique from uh, I visited one of the Toyota uh, Toso uh, painting painting company, and I brought uh, textile because uh, they are using um, a window frame or door knob of the car, 
in Germany, and um, I visited there, and uh, well, here is the plastic material, which means polyester. So if you are using plastic, uh, then you could do in the same process of you are doing it for the car industry. And they said, of course, no. We need a huge amount, like a 10,000 meter or a lot. But uh, luckily, we um, have a, a factory now. But at the time, it was a really, really hard to get into. But still, there are some people uh, interested my request. And uh, only one person can get into the what, that br break the you know, that's right, yeah, so that's why I got this one, but so sorry for the people who bought this one seven eighty seven because we did uh, this fabric together with the car automobile um, industry, so that means the price was. 37,000 yen, which is nearly $400 per meter. And they bought this one. Thank you. But now, <laughs> <laughs> now it's cost like reducing because one of the textile industries set up exact the same technique. So, and we sold this one 700, no, 7,000 yen, which is $70 per meter. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing's happening. Yeah. Uh, it's great to see how your work is, ba is really a multidisciplinary effort that, that synthesizes work from so many different fields. So some people leave because they have class. I hope you're not uh, offended. Um, I think we'll open it up to the audience before, before more people um, need to leave. If there's any questions and comments, I think this mic can be roaming around. Hi, uh, I actually have a question more about your business strategy. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, you make it look really easy to keep experimenting all the time with every project. And anyone from design background, you know, we know how expensive it is to experiment. But, you know, seeing that you've had your company for 33 years now, I'd like to understand kind of like where does your urge of experimenting like stop for the purpose of getting the project What, what is the urge means? Huh? What, what, what urge means? Urge, this, this yeah. Well, yeah, where does your experiment, how do you stop your experimentation? Or maybe you have someone that does that for you. <laughs> um, so you can kind of accomplish kind of the product. Also, that, that, I guess that also question is, how do you make money? Perhaps I didn't make any money. <laughs> uh, all of the people are saying, like, Reiko, you are such a bad business person, even like you've been doing this business for more than 30 years, but we are still small, very, very small. But we are lucky, we, we can survive. And, um, yeah, and also lately, like, to, after 2008, I've been designing, like, uh, design consulting the company, and I got some uh, income, and I spent all the money I got from the, uh, uh, <laughs> well, from, like, a Muji and so on, and uh, making a new um, textile. And sometimes, like, uh, like architect project, we could get some uh, profit, but some didn't. Actually, really, really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
I didn't give you any good advice for business point of view. I just had no, 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 no. Even like my um, agent in America, uh, he complained to me, Leiko, you are such a bad, bad. <laughs> Sorry. I also have a, a question that's about balance between two things. Um, I think in your, what's extremely compelling or beautiful to me in the work is a kind of balance between pattern and irregularity or some kind of flaw or imperfection that is not, it, it's not so imperfect as to as to suggest a lack of control. But the imperfection shows something about the process of making. It shows that there are different possibilities, different results based on the process. I wonder if you could talk about how you strike a balance between that process and the outcome that produces these kinds of natural, if you will, natural flaws or natural um, results. I don't know if this is a good uh, answer or not, but um, I think eight, um, begin, no, mid of 90s, I just uh, got the comment from uh, a curator of a modern art museum in New York, and I actually made a textile could change a little bit depending on how you use it. And I really love it. But at the time, like, the curator was saying, like, Leiko, this has not controlled by you who uh, designed the textile. So this one, you didn't really, really control. And uh, that was really, really learned a lot. And since then, I tried to make uh, my own boundary between this is the design, this is not design. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to be a designer. So that case, um, the fabric has to control. And if I didn't control the fabric, then I will not produce. So even like those um, last last line, mm -hmm. but I I could control even like this like a natural effect. So this one is hundred percent same color, but this has half white and half mm -hmm. the colored. So this I kind of like could control. Is that the right answer? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an example, yeah, absolutely. Yes. So that's um, um, always try to control. Kana? Do kana? Um, your, in your presentation, there was a lot uh, to do with folding. That looks like a technique you're working with a lot. And I'm just curious, do you find that like cellulose-based uh, fabrics are most conducive to doing that technique? Or were those um, petroleum-based materials, the ones that uh, cooperate most with folding technique? Yes. If you want to do, if you want to create uh, something sculptural and fold, what fabric are you using? What are the uh, properties of the fabric itself? Yeah, yeah. Yes, is it petroleum-based, cellulose, animal? That, that is a stainless, stainless fabric. Oh, they're metal. Are they always metal? metal yeah. oh, okay.
Yeah, but it, it can be, uh, it can, ma many different materials uh, can be used. And, uh, and uh, depend on the material property, like she, mm -hmm. she used a, she used a, like a thick, thicker paper when okay. you use a metal and yeah, uh, like a, The methodology is the same, but uh, yes. like, uh, yeah, thickness or strength right. uh, to keep, to keep the form is going to be different. Cool. You can also close other True. Areas. Right. I just wondered what she preferred to. So so far the, the other than the metal, like mm -hmm. she she mostly used the polyester. Okay. Uh, so that they can remember uh, the right. form. Yeah. Oh she's also trying the fiberglass to make oh. the that that kind of So, so she's trying to, uh, to, to, so she's trying to set, uh, install that uh, kind of form, of fa uh, fabric to the ceiling mm -hmm. of the kind of large, uh, large project, uh, which needs a fireproof. So, uh -huh. in this sense, she, she she's now trying the, like uh, to enlarge the boundary of the material. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Anybody else? While you're thinking, I have another thought for you. Uh, it seems from the images and even from the work that we see here, a lot of the innovation is on a very small scale. Just looking at the this particularities of these patterns, uh, the sort of color, even the material properties. Um, however, the installations have actually gotten large and much larger, seeing of some of the building installations. So I'm just wondering in terms of your work as a designer, the actual design happens on these two very radically different scales. One is a kind of centimeter scale, and one is actually meter, 10 meter, 20 meter scale. How do you negotiate those scales? And do you find that the work on the small scale at some at times changes coming back from looking at the large scale and, and the other way around? And what, what ways do you have to visualize the effects and imagine the effects that you've produced on the small scale and, and scale them up into a spatial dimension of a building. そのさ、さってこと uh, there's no no difference uh, in terms of the thinking about like a micro scale and large scale. Uh, almost almost no. <laughs> she has never felt like that. Tatoeba. Mm. Mm. Like three or five years ago, we got a big uh, uh, a project in Kyoto, a treasure house of uh, Manpuku temples, which is the oldest temple in uh, Kyoto. And they built a new um, uh, treasure room. It's a big building. And they wanted to cover entire space to cover it with this technique. And this one, we should make all done by hand because we don't have, we couldn't find the factory 
since we designed this one in 1993. So when we got the order, all of the hand process done by us, even like a hard, like a um, vacuum process and using a high-tech machine. And we have a textile labo, um, government uh, building in each textile mill, and we are using a textile labo. We don't have our own factory, so but luckily we can pay like 1,000 yen for uh, three hours. It's really cheap. <laughs> so in the, all the equipment we could use. Like you, you, your university have a fantastic, like a, f Machine, yes, it's shop. amazing, yeah. amazing places, but uh, we don't have that sort of, but we l still have a great uh, textile labo in like a Kyoto and Kiryu and the Hachoji and so on. And we are using that facility, but everything done by us. So we made paper mold for sometimes like 2,000 meter or 3,000 meter and uh, folding by hand by ourself. It's not what we enjoy. Really, really seriously, we have 11 people, but all of them, we we, we really, really enjoy. And uh, well, this, like a recycling paper, are not able to use uh, more than like 10 times. So we have to print it, well, we had to make a uh, mold, because the building height is more than 10 meter, and we covered entire in red origami fold. And we are so happy. Yeah. And we get some <laughs> <laughs> at the time. Maybe I would like to ask you the same kind of question in a different way. So how do you usually assume or imagine the effect of its like reflection or light in a huge scale? Because even if you, you know, Although you can design like you know in the same way you know between the small scale or large scale, it's really hard to imagine how the sunshine you know is going to be in uh, this kind of textile or something. So how do you usually imagine the you know great magnificent you know light effects in a huge scale, even if if you are designing like with really sm uh, with a hand by hand usually. えっとね、まずあの、とにかくえ、あのね、えっと、基本的にやっぱり光をあの、どれだけ光をどれだけあの、反射させるかっていうところがすごく大事で、え、テキスタルの場合はもうその断面で決まるんですよ。で、シルク
uh, imagine or assume the effect of reflection by designing the section of each material, and then you know assume the light effect or something. Thank you so much. So, um, Reiko-san, I just wanted to thank you for um, for being here and uh, uh, for uh, and also thank Martin for mm -hmm. um, for. Um, uh, being uh, in opening up to discussion. Um, uh, one thing is that um, um, I have known actually Reiko for a long time, longer than you, Ladies. longer than you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you remember one of the slides that she showed with uh, LV, with LVMH, uh, there was a time where LV moved to Japan and they really were trying to be very experimental with architecture. And uh, she showed this project from 2002. And this is actually when um, we did an exhibition in that building in Omotosando. Right. But what's interesting is if uh, you look at the work of uh, Jun Aoki, who was the architect, he's also using this idea of the mesh right. on the outside of the building. And the building has this kind of layering, which is not dissimilar to what's happening in the top floor gallery, where the um, curtain material is being used on the, on the inside. I think it's very important that we acknowledge that, at least for the last uh, 15 or so years, there's been a lot of interrelationship between textile, fashion, and architecture in terms of how certain companies are using the perceptual questions or perceptual issues in architecture. So the facade is, is not just really the outer skin, but it is something or a way of making things, which is also directly related to our questions of perception. So sometimes when I look at Reiko San's work, I think it's architecture. I don't think about it as textile. I think about it as something which is really part and parcel of how we make buildings. And I could look at many of these things and say, well, these are also the facades of buildings in a way. Why don't we think in this kind of experimental, why, do, why aren't we being so innovative? If she can fold and bend and burn the building or something, burn the facade, we should also <laughs> be able to do a little bit of that. No, I mean, I'm being, I think that it's very, I think what's inspiring for me always Every time I go to Tokyo, I, I go and see see her. <laughs> Thank you very uh, much. No, it's, you it's, help uh, yes, our uh, business a lot. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's yeah 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 okay okay. But I think it's really exciting to think about these things almost as one thing in terms of the creativity, even though the textile is very different than the building. But the the conditions of sort of imagining the patterns and the creativity is very similar. And in architecture, we have this whole history of the idea of cladding or bikleidung, of what the fabric was originally supposed to be, the, the external skin in sort of Semper's term. So she is doing that now in the hotel, in the Mandarin Oriental, or in the LVMH on the inside. But actually, this is very much the same idea of how you use the notion of covering. And the textile is, in some ways, that covering. So I think this is a very um, important contribution in a way, both to textiles, but also to, to architecture in some way. So, um, so really, I, that's why it's, it's inspiring both as the thing, but also as, uh, as sort of ideas that one thinks about. And I think it would be wonderful if people want to come and touch the material or experiment or, or talk to Reiko-san if there's a little bit of time, I think actually um, the kind of tactile quality of these things is, uh, is very, very important. Anyway, just wanted to say thank you very much for everything and what you have done. Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you.